let, let us start with the Indian economy, Amir, because that is very important for us, uh, particularly for this, for us to get some sense of what's happening. So to initiate this discussion, let me throw some numbers, you know, um, you know that COVID has hit the uh, Indian economy and COVID is something what as an economist, we call it exogenous, something what the uh, planner or the policymakers uh, didn't plan for. And just to put things into perspective, uh, the size of the economy actually shrank from around 2.9 trillion US dollar in 2019-20 to 2.6 trillion in 2020-21. Now GDP growth has also slowed down from 4% in 2019 to negative 8% in 2020-20. And we are hoping that because it is negative 8%, which is a low base, this year we'll be growing at at least 9%, but now what I hear, what uh, World Bank or IMF or ADB are predicting that our economy is going to grow at 6%. Now, there is a problem with this uh, slow growth rate, you know, and um, as an economist, I think you know it better, which is uh, there will be lesser number of jobs which are going to get created. And more importantly, because people have less job opportunities, the income distribution is going to be more skewed. You know, uh, we already read in newspaper and Oxfam has come out with a report where they are suggesting that the super rich like Ambani's and Adani's of the world, they are becoming richer. And people like uh, maybe you and me, I, I don't know about, and I mean, we are still lucky because we are in the services sector, but most of others, you know, uh, they are without any jobs and the income distribution is becoming highly skewed. In fact, some of the sectors are actually gaining. For instance, if you are working in the services sector, you will find that uh, these are the people who are working uh, uh, at, at, uh, in their home without their income getting affected. In fact, a friend of mine who worked as a uh, HR manager at TCS was telling me that TCS even uh, has given a uh, pay hike. You know, so the 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 concern is here is a, a set of people. Uh, larger set of people who are actually uh, getting eff affected from the slowing down of the economy, but only a very few uh, among us who are getting maybe benefited. So as an economist, what do you suggest, what do we do about it? So thanks so much for this. Uh, it's quite an honor to be speaking to you first, mm -hmm. because you are somebody who I really admire for all the work you've done. But also at the Mahindra University, you know, um, a new, uh, not, I mean, you know, very well-known place in Hyderabad, a city that I belong to, a city that I admire. Um, and in organizing this conversation, because I think that this conversation is really critical for, uh, for, uh, for our students, particularly, because they are going to now um, into world, get into a world that is that is a post-COVID world. And in this, it will be important to address a few issues that you have raised. Now, what is this that, uh, I noticed that there are some of my friends here, Devashish Ru is also here. Thanks so much everybody for having joined. joined. So, Professor Samin Fatima is here. Uh, thanks so much all of you. Uh, it's an honor to be speaking to everyone on this particular issue. Now, um, see the core question that Nilanjan is asking on the, on the economy itself is an important one. And the point that he made about the services sector and the manufacturing sector is again a very critical uh, issue. Now, therefore, now there, uh, Nilanjan, my observation is that this growth rate that you are talking about uh, is the big cause for concern. And uh, you see what has happened is that what the first point that we need to make is that India's growth rate has been declining much earlier than uh, COVID. It is very easy to blame COVID on what is happening. But if you see all the indicators in December 2019, uh, you know, much before we even knew the spelling of Wuhan, um, in December 2019, you found that our unemployment rate was the highest ever, uh, you know, in the past 45 years, it basically means highest ever. Um, the growth rate has slowed down to the lowest growth rate in about 17 quarters. 
exports had been declining for 23 quarters consistently and the exchange rate was at its lowest. So it is December 19 that where the problem starts. And after COVID, the economy just goes into a, into a free fall. But the point to note is that most of the structural issues are becoming serious before COVID. So there is, so we have to make that distinction, and that is an important distinction, particularly for all the students who are uh, who are listening to us and uh, deciding their future. Now, uh, the point that Nilanjan is making, the important point that he is making, is that in some sense there is a there is a protection that the service sector has. Uh, but you know, Nilanjan, that's that's where I want to make the first important point because I am addressing this mostly to new students and future students. The point I am making here is that uh, see what uh, what happened in COVID was something that was rather uh, unprecedented and that is where most of us economists are getting worried. Uh, you all know that we had 100 million people without jobs before COVID and that went up to about 180 million by conservative uh, estimates. Most of these were the unskilled labor. Most of these were the migrant unskilled labor who you saw walking back home in that gruesome, in those gruesome pictures in the first lockdown. But you know, there is a slight, uh, there is a, while the, while the picture is very macabre and horrifying, the future for them is not so bleak because what happens is that as soon as the economy starts, starts, going back, these people find jobs. It's easier, uh, it's pretty easy for them to, to find jobs and that's what you saw. You saw that the unemployment rate, which had gone up swimming high, uh, came back to a stable, whatever, 6-7% for uh, migrant labor and for unskilled labor. The problem is with people like us, Nilan, mm. that when we lose our jobs, then even when the economy picks up, it is very difficult to get those jobs back and that is the problem that we are seeing. That the educated unemployed are the ones that are very vulnerable today. So let, let me interject. In fact, what you said is so true because if I'm looking into the overall unemployment number, it is around eight percent. But if I'm talking about the unemployment among the graduates, it's actually fifteen percent. Like as you correctly mentioned, for this migrant labor, it's quite easy for them to find a job because they, uh, as Bhagavati would call it, it's more like a splintering effect. You know, you you still need watchman for your society, you still need someone to ferry your, uh, uh, let's say, uh, product using Swiggy or Zomato of the world. So the so-called the gig workers, you know, but but as you correctly mentioned, it is it is the under, uh, it is the people who want to get employment in the services, uh, in the skill services and the manufacturing sectors. These are the ones who are actually in bad shape. And they find it difficult to get the job back because what happens, Nilanjan, and again for everybody, what happens is that in the organized sector, in the educated sector, in the slightly skilled sector, we all get very quickly accustomed to a lower staff uh, count. Uh, all of you who are who are watching this will know that you know it's very easy for for me because I have now lost five people and I only have seven people, and they are doing the work. So for me, it is great. I keep those five, make them do the work, and I cut costs by nearly 120%. So that is the seductive nature of this kind of unemployment. And that is what we have to watch out for when we are training and, and teaching our uh, skilled workforce. So, and that is why it's important that uh, universities like the Mahindra University, like professors like Nilanjan Banik become important. <laughs> You know, you know. I, I make a serious point, Nilanjan, because right. you know, uh, because you see, what you are doing mm -hmm. is that you are now talking about courses that are ready for this technology-driven world. Mm -hmm. You are not talking about courses that you know the Hyderabad University or the Meerut University will teach, which belongs to a manufacturing-driven world that is pre-technology, pre-COVID. Your uh, your goal, therefore, and the goal of this con seminar is is exactly that: is mm -hmm. to see what the new youngsters who don't have those those jobs that went away, but have new jobs, are going to look for look mm -hmm. forward to. 
so so the 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 so 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 to all of you while we started off on a on a on a somber note saying that you know unemployment is going up and uh, uh, that jobs are lesser the good news is that the new jobs that are going to hit the market will need new, new skills they will not have people they will not hire people who passed out 5 years ago and 10 years ago they will hire people who are going to pass out next year and the year after that is the good news for you in fact uh, what you said is so true because again i was looking at the numbers you know so the nss data suggests that there are around 984 universities in india now every year around 37 million students uh, get enrolled for graduate, graduation yeah. yeah out of which 4 million is just distance education and we have close to 15 lakhs um, graduate who pass out as engineers now yeah. i still remember when i was a young kid uh, like most of this uh, students uh, our parents used to have aspiration that uh, my son will either become a doctor or an engineer yeah. now i uh, of course you can see i i have uh, failed uh, uh, <laughs> meet that aspiration of my parent so eventually i turned as an economist but i i don't um, in 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 looking behind i don't regret because nowadays if you talk to some of the uh, young uh, graduate engineers their uh, starting salary is around 20000 you know and a top notch driver gets a cab driver he makes more than that you know so i think what you mentioned a few minutes back is very important that we are i think most of the universities in india they are uh, failing to uh impart the necessary skill which is required for this new age world you know and then i'll stop you here for a minute and yeah. you know talk you talked about not being becoming an engineer well the <laughs> bad news is that i became one right you know i like a poor south indian i had no choice but to get into engineering college you know otherwise you were useless and then what happened Oh, we were 63 who joined uh, the department of electronics and communication in the usmania university one of the top universities at that time 45 of us graduated of the 45 there are two today who work as engineers okay 43 of us are economists uh, civil servants managers um, data analysts so you know um, the job yeah you also got in through the civil servant uh, and i also went into yeah. the civil service yeah. yeah so you know i i did engineering went away and did management then got into the ias then became a professor of economics and that is the case with most of my classmates you see the what has happened is that while we learned a lot of uh, useful skills in college it was great there was no uh, there was no question about it but what we had to do to get into uh, into good jobs was to reskill ourselves and we did mm-hmm. that extreme and that is the focus that new institutions should have mm-hmm. you know those skills that are skills for 2025 and 2030 mm-hmm. in fact i was shocked to see a recent uh, news article published by times of india which says that the median salary for a fresh graduate in uh, engineering graduate is only 2.5 lakhs so uh, yeah. then why do it <laughs> and that's if you are lucky nilanjan yeah that's, that's if, if you are lucky yeah see of the 1 and 1/2 million who graduate yes if you are in the half a million who get jobs yes. then your salary is 2.5 lakhs yes so so yeah so a, that 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 is actually so true because out of 15 lakhs only 3 lakhs are jobs. able to get the jobs yeah, yeah. yeah. and the, their median is uh, 2.5 lakhs you know so which tells me that uh, which uh, brings me to the next thing that as a government what we should do in order to ensure that the quality of education that is because it's a, it's a clear an issue of uh, people or some uni- private university taking uh, advantage of the system you know yeah. so do you think that uh, there there is a need to uh, standardize the curriculum or uh, ensure that Uh, most of the universities uh, whatever they are delivering uh, there should be some a body to oversee uh, that they don't dupe the uh, parents or they don't dupe the students and float whatever i i, I still remember um, during last time when i was in hyderabad there were many engineering colleges which were getting closed you know so of course the market will take care of it now we see the corporate coming into the pictures and they are backing all these private universities including us ours you know which is backed by mahindras but uh, 
do you think that uh, apart from market, government can also do something in order to ensure that uh, the 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 quality of education is uh, somehow guaranteed? You know. Oh, Nirendra, this is a tough question, and my uh, and you know uh, my honest answer is that I don't think we need another regulatory body. We've had we've had very very bad uh, uh, you know uh, experience with regulatory bodies uh, mm. who in, in in by way of standardizing um, uh, syllabi uh, got a race to the bottom, which we all suffered from. I think that you know we have to depend on people like you uh, who. Will take the university to a to a different level simply because you are going to offer a fabulous international degree and a course, and and your reputation and that is what will drive quality. It will not be a body that is you know that's a renamed AICT or whatever that will decide what the course structure should be. um you know uh, look at some of our engineering schools some of the better engineering schools the moment they realize that they are going to uh, face this problem of unemployment they uh, they you know altered their courses and they got they got a heavy dose of for example i know of at least at least three which gave a very solid dose of uh, economics i was very happy to note one university which approached me and said uh, five years ago they said that sir we've done a careful analysis of where our engineers get jobs and we find that a large number of them are now getting uh, jobs in the healthcare sector okay so why don't you do a course for them on health economics i was shocked i said engineering health economics but you know they did a careful analysis of their placements and found that it was general electric and all the medical devices people who are hiring these engineers so they ought to know what the difference between tb and covid okay. and that is when we actually ran and that's the opportunity that we have here vilanjan okay. and that is what that's why i'm so so happy that you are you know uh, that you all are taking a lead in this because you clearly understand uh, where the wind is blowing where the jobs are where what the sunrise sectors are and that is what we need our children to get skilled on for example when you were teaching uh, courses in economic policy right you know it was it was the the direction was policy and that is when your your uh, students got better jobs because they had a good uh, understanding of economic policy or development policy mm -hmm. so that is how we will tailor our courses and for that what we need is greater freedom to universities than lesser freedom less standardization and more diversity mm -hmm. now now uh, i i have to ask you another challenge that uh, we are yes. facing at the time of covid which is about because you mentioned we mentioned about technology and one aspect is we are now doing online teaching you know yes. now the online teaching is problematic not so much for people like us but for people who are living in small towns and villages in all probability uh, if you happens to come from a small town or village then either electricity uh, electricity connection or connectivity internet connectivity is a big issue you know even at benet yeah. um, uh, where i used to yeah. work a few months back uh, we used to uh, listen student complaining that sir we cannot take up the exam or we cannot uh, come to your classroom we don't know whether it's true or uh, not true uh, but they used to say that uh, a i cannot have for the data because uh, my parents are not that rich yeah. um, in fact uh, when i went and looked into the nsso of uh, 2017 it says that 6% of the rural household and 25% of the urban household has computer you know That's now right. in, in terms of internet connectivity the data suggest again 17% in urban areas and 42% in uh, 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 sorry 42% in the uh, urban area and 17 only 17% in the rural area they have internet connectivity uh, and this is again very important because we are talking about the income distribution most of the students uh, most of the people in the uh, living in small town or in rural areas they live in one room apartment you know and uh, which means that even if i want to attend a class even if i have internet connection even if i have power connection but because the family size is more uh, somehow i am not able to Uh, carefully attend the class and if you happen to be a girl child and there are some studies to suggest that anyway i will be uh, pulled for doing all this household chores 
which means that in terms of gender also, if I'm considering the gender as a output, uh, there, there are problems. So how do we face this challenge of online teaching at the time of COVID? Uh, brilliant, Nilanjan. You know, this is a very critical point. Uh, in all the places that I teach, every place we face that problem. At the Indian School of Business, where you have rich kids studying, at the National Law School, where you have the brightest uh, people. Um, you know, I at our tra the IAS training institute that we have in Telangana, where I teach. In each of these places, we had the we had exactly the same problem. Now, it is a fact that uh, online education is actually has actually uh, has actually been detrimental to a lot of our students. There is a lot of data coming in now, and I can give you very simply that the better state, uh, Telangana is a better state. In mm. Telangana, uh, at best, we have been able to reach about 28% of our students. This is the best state. You know, imagine Bihar, where 4%, yeah, right. yeah, where only 4% could access online education. So the fact is that online education has been uh, has been great for us as faculty because, you know, I could just move from my uh, drawing room into my study and start my class um, with, with zero, you know, uh, disturbances and all my notes in front of me. But for students, it has been disempowering. And that's why you find that estimates are that about 25 million children have left school forever. They will never come back. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the SDG on literacy for all has suffered a huge setback. Uh, as has the as has another SDG SDG which is very relevant to all of us, which is uh, gainful employment. You see, what has happened is that and for the benefit of the audience, what is gainful in, uh, employment? Okay, thanks. You know, thanks for asking that question. Uh, you know, I, I always explain it to uh, to my students in class that you see what does employment mean? What does gainful or what does relevant or what does useful employment? or as the SDG says, decent employment mean. It means something that adds to the GDP, mm -hmm. right? So even if, you know, if the country is producing 100 rupees worth of goods, if you join and, and that becomes 100 plus Delta or 101, then that is gainful employment. If it only means that I take some money out of Nilanjan's pocket and put it in yours, then that is not gainful employment. Mm -hmm. There was this one member of parliament who was arguing, that begging is employment, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you see, and he's right, you know, this fellow who's begging is earning money. But the problem is that George is taking 10 rupees out of his pocket and giving him money. It is just a transfer. It is not a value addition. And that is why that famous quote um, where, you know, we were uh, encouraged to fry pakoras, that is not really gainful employment. You know, it is not something that people aspire for. You can, you can do various. Things. So gainful employment is something that is value added. And that is what you, are, you all hopefully are going to get into, value added uh, jobs. So uh, that SDG also is going to get hit, Nilanjan, because you see a lot of these uh, jobs um, that we are now looking at are merely either just transfers of money or, or, you know, I mean, some people argue one of the standard things in the in 101 economics is that suppose somebody is a robber. He mm. goes and robs somebody's house and earns 10,000 rupees. Now, isn't that uh, adding to the GDP? <laughs> isn't, right. that, uh, isn't that something that is gainful? He's, uh, he is, uh, you know, uh, supporting his entire family with that money. No, it is not. Because it is just a transfer of money. So, therefore... Yeah. What we have to look at are jobs that are that add to the national economy. Uh, Nilanjan's uh, column today talks about how this year we've actually seen, for the first time in our living history, we have seen a contraction in the economy, where mm. the economy was 2.8 trillion and contracted to 2.6 trillion. Uh, and, and here, Nilanjan, one point that everybody should understand is that in countries like India, growth rate is very critical, is very crucial. Why do we constantly hanker after high growth rate? Why do we want a 10% growth rate all the time? You see, the reason for that is not that we want to, you know, uh, become Adani or Ambani and become all of us get more money. No, the policy reason for a high growth rate is because there is a very strong correlation between rate of growth and employment. There is enough data that suggests that if GDP growth rate comes down by 1%, right? Hear me out. I hope you understand what I'm saying. If GDP growth rate comes down by 1%, 
employment goes down by 0.5%. See, that's a huge impact. That is why when growth goes from 8% to 7%, you can't say, oh, but 7% is growth, isn't it? It is growth, definitely. But it means that 0.5% of our jobs are gone forever. Now, if growth has come down from 9% to minus 8%, you can imagine what's going on. In the two years, and this is Nilanjan's calculation that I was reading today, in the two years, effectively, we would have grown by just 2%, which means that from the 6% that we were growing in 2017-18, we would have lost at least 7% of our total jobs, lost them. That is why it is serious. That is why growth rate is serious. And that is why when this year, India's growth rate was lower than every single economy in the world. You see, every economy got impacted by COVID. But our growth rate fell the sharpest. And that is why looking at the, at the economy is very important and looking at the recovery is very important. The recovery is coming. It will definitely come. Sooner or later, we have some structural problems. It might take a little longer. But by the time you guys who are joining this year are graduating, we are certainly seeing a recovery. And therefore, we have to prepare you for the jobs that will emerge in 2024 and 2025. Very well said. But I also want to uh, bring down another important topic. How uh, much are we to blame the technology? Because what is also happening is uh, technology is also taking away the jobs. You know, So whether we have COVID or no COVID, but uh, if you see even in the uh, automobile assembly line, you know, now it's the robotics who are actually doing the work of the labors. You know? and, uh, and, and there are plenty of such instances, you know, um, even I, I was talking with another friend of mine who teaches right now in the US. He was suggesting uh, maybe 10 years down the line, they will not require any more professors because everything, even in US, uh, most of the kids are now, um, they are going for home study. You know, They are not even going to school because everything is documented. Everything is available over net. So, so how much of this technology is also going to take away the job and what should we do um, so that, technology become a complement, not a substitute, you know, for the job uh, creation thing? Uh, tough question, Milanian, you know, <laughs> uh, because you're really asking an economist who's very good at analyzing past data to now predict the future. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, we economists, we can't tell you what will happen tomorrow, but we'll give you a very good understanding of what happened yesterday. So, you know, right. but, but, you know, on this job front, I mean, what is for sure is that this whole industrial revolution four is going to see a, uh, a major uh, automation of work. Yeah. But, but, you know, uh, if you see our, see the history of the world for the last 200 years, especially post the industrial revolution, almost always technology has, has presented the specter of, falling employment. You remember when we were uh, joining work, and I was, you are, you're far too young, then, you know, the computers were supposed to take away all jobs. All right. Banks were supposed to close down. But uh, it was exactly the opposite that happened. So mm -hmm. I think that um, if you go by, by the historical trend, yes, we will see a lot of automation take away a lot of traditional jobs. It will take away the jobs of of didactic professors like Amirullah, mm -hmm. but it will not be able to replace a dynamic Nilanjan money. So that's right. why I, I, I think they have coined <laughs> the word humble, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that no, but I you know I'm actually making that point in the sense that you see what will happen is that a lot of accounting jobs will go away. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Uh, surgeries, surgeons might be might be replaced by robots. They already mm -hmm. are, but you will not be able to take away the doctor. You will not be able to take away the philosopher, philosopher teacher. You right. will not be able to take away the auditor. You can take away the accountant. So what will happen is that jobs will necessarily change. The Stanford University has a brilliant project that is looking at jobs in 2040. And it tells you that what are those jobs that will go away. And, and you know, some of those that I mentioned, uh, uh, surgeons and accountants and so on, will go away. But you will see a lot more jobs coming in uh, which will require a multidisciplinary approach and an analytical approach, a lot of soft skills, uh, the ability to think as an economist. You know, those are the kind of things that will uh, that will burgeon. And that is what we have to prepare students for. And that is what the new courses are doing. 
Mm-hmm. So you are not only so so you know so you are not a technologist in my mm-hmm. time. If you could write a write some code, or if you could you know debug a, a Y two K problem, then you got a great job. But now, or if you could type, you know, <laughs> in our days, if you learn typewriting, then you got a job. Now those skills are are inbuilt. You know those skills mm-hmm. are by and by. It's like driving. What you have to learn is skills on top of that. You know, in Nilanjan there was this principle of Eton. uh in the famous uh, british school who was telling us one day that when when kids come into his class in in the first standard he tells them that you know 90% of you will go to jobs that don't exist today okay <laughs> so so you know if there is a third standard or a fifth standard student today who knows what he is going to be then that is that is extremely foolish because that job is not going to be there when he is graduating that is true about most of our university students now mm-hmm. that when they come into a ba first year five years later they will join jobs that might not be there today you know when i was doing electronics engineering you know this whole computer graphics and stuff we didn't even know about it. now it's there everywhere so that uh, that uh, ability to look forward uh, is something that we need to that we need to worry about i think you are I, giving I, a very important message which is even in terms of uh, designing the curriculum it has to be dynamic you know um, yeah. and 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 just to be uh, uh, ensure that uh, we teach what is required uh, in the job market you know so and therefore this whole idea of uh, collaborating with the industry trying to know from them what is the required skill set in fact in one of our program Uh, uh bba in uh, digital technology we have uh, entered into a collaboration with bond group you know it's a big uh, group uh, based out of us and essentially what we are trying to figure out that what are the required skill which is still uh, uh, yeah. in vogue in the job market you know so so i think uh, that's a very important thing and because in the i i really love to continue this discussion with you because uh so many important things are coming up but in the interest of time i will uh, ask you one last question and then i will uh, open it up for the audience is uh, what what message you have to give for our economics and finance uh, graduate uh, because th- th- these are the one these are the kids uh, who are going to um, pass out 3 years from now so what type of skill do you think they should acquire uh, for them to be relevant or stay relevant in the job market yeah you know thanks nilanjan you know when um, when somebody like you asks me to give this answer um, i realize that i will uh, i am getting into dangerous territory what if it doesn't happen like that but you know uh, if you look at uh, past trends and if you see what is happening especially in india uh, there are certain very clear answers that we have uh, for all of you who are graduating in economics and finance one of the largest sectors that is opening up is economic policy see that is a big se- sector and what does what does economic policy mean you see what is happening is and this is a good sign that that indian policy making is showing you know however much we can be politically ideologically placed what is a good thing that has happened in india over the past is that now more and more policy is based is evidence based you know when when we pass policy uh, pass laws or acts or rules whether it is at the center or state or even at the municipal levels you will find that a lot of our young elected representatives are actually asking this question so what does this policy mean what does it do what will be its impact what is the cost of implementing this policy and this is what economists do very well this is what you all will be taught you know how do you measure the cost of in or you know take an example like a narega what is the cost of implementing that scheme and what is the benefit and obviously as a rational person if the benefit exceeds the cost go do it if it does not stop it so what will happen is that that a lot and it's already happening you know the number of people who i for example employ who can measure impact so i i i for a long time i was with the gates foundation and at gates foundation we always used to look for uh, economists who could go out there and tell us that we have done this intervention on tb this intervention on hiv aids this intervention on maternal health and this is a lousy investment 
because it the costs are higher than the benefits or this is a great investment you know, online teaching uh, nilanjan mm -hmm. is the cost higher than the benefit but my fear and, is if you're uh, suggesting that maybe intervention in tv or hiv is bad compared to others don't you think like uh, if you talk to any doctor friends of yours they will now tell you that because people are so involved with covid other diseases are getting neglected you know? they are they are yeah so yeah. so there is also a flip side to it right and you know who pointed it out it were these economists who were working on it they pointed it out it was not the doctors because the doctors got carried away with covid yeah. it was the economists who said that look at tv a million people are dying how can you stop funding that so that's an that's a good example so you know so therefore one that's one major area and it's in, and it's uh, you know employing lots of people i was telling you that at the gates foundation we used to look for such people and unfortunately no university in india could give us this skills we had to buy, buy them from the us and it is very expensive right so so you will all have a great uh, thing going as far as economic policies so the second area that you will have a lot of employment will be in terms of data you see as you can see all that is happening today the pegasus story is what everybody yeah. knows what is the pegasus story it is really a data story right mm -hmm. so so when you have tons and tons of data when you have millions of rows and millions of columns how do you analyze that that is something that a good economist with good skills is able to do and that is the that is the future right mm -hmm. a third area that again is important for economists and has been for a long time but now because of large investments that are being made is the ability to model growth to model problems to look at issues later on a fourth area and that i think nilanjan is the biggest area that economists will get into will be into decision making you see um what i mean by that is that you know a lot of us get into are employed as managers right several of you are managers when you are manager when you are managing something what are you doing managing essentially is decision making right. right from a list of options you have to choose the best and you can make mistakes now it is a good economist who's who is uh, you know skilled in game theory skilled in modeling who can say that okay of the following options the best option is x you know you want to you want to stop corruption there is there are various ways of doing it is demonetization the best way of doing it? right so you take that decision and and it's a big decision it impacts millions of people it impacts millions of people for 5 6 7 years as we are seeing in india so that is the area where you feel that you'll find that a lot of the the traditional managers will be replaced by the economists who will be who will have the skill to choose the right variables and decide and that's why you know see I, I, let me give you simple examples uh the big managers of the world the most successful managers of the world uh, could they predict the 2008 crisis That's and look at the billion, look at the trillions of dollars we lost mm. if we predict covid 19 mm. right? so therefore uh, that is one skill that uh, so these are the four big areas i'm sure there are several more you know i'm sure that some economists will also become great javelin throwers and win mm. the next <laughs> next day <goal. laughs> yeah. but, but but they but these four are very critical skills that 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 forward looking institutions mm. that institutions that are dexterous uh will and dynamic will be able to deploy thank you very much i think it's been a great um, listening to you there are so much uh, newer information that you brought to the table and i'm sure that our student community also have gained quite a bit so now let me open it to the audience if you have any question for uh, professor amir um so i already have a question so it says that do you think stable coin uh, can take over as currency so i think what she is referring so this question is coming from shreyas she is asking that uh, yeah she is asking about yeah, bitcoin yes yeah bitcoins yeah shreyas you know again <laughs> such a tough question you know the bitcoins have been around for a while some of us who are skeptical thought that this is a fad and it will disappear very quickly it hasn't it's actually become a fairly strong uh, investment uh, decision so 
the safe answer that i will give is that while cryptocurrencies don't appear to be taking over the currency uh, function they are certainly becoming very strong investment portfolio for parts of your investment portfolio so i don't know but i th- because i am very skeptical about this the reserve bank of india is very skeptical but i think that it might become uh, it might become a good investment decision uh, destination not necessarily uh, a transactional instrument not necessarily something that is a that is a negotiable instrument maybe i don't yeah i think it's a uh, tough question yeah. as a, as a trader you would like to shy away from cryptocurrency because it's highly volatile you know very volatile may, very yeah volatile. very volatile but maybe if i i'm looking into the long term trend maybe it's a good investment idea uh, so that that would be the short answer so do we have any other question for professor amish guys don't feel shy please ask if you have a question <laughs> Ajay Prashant yeah. uh, Tak is asking question. Can you talk about the on the possibility of realizing decent work, uh, meaning as in brilliant, yeah. better working well, conditions? Brilliant question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In brilliant. the informal sector. Yeah. yeah, very good question, Prashant. You know, and the reason I think it's a great question is because for the first time we saw what all of us who are not you know professional development economists saw what saw the working conditions of our labor. you know when they when they started walking back home we suddenly realized that these are people who don't have a home these are people who we pay a pittance to and they live in such horrible conditions and that's the labor arbitrage that is there that's the wage arbitrage they have that is why most of us are able to afford to live in cities because we have very very poor poorly paid help you can get a house help for 20 dollars you can get a driver for 100 dollars you know you can get a gardener for 10 dollars and that is the reason so therefore i think this question becomes very critical and that is why in the informal sector uh, prashant there are a number of policy initiatives that we must take beginning from a very thorough um, redefinition of minimum wages you know um, imagine that the minimum wage in india now right with all this now we are talking about 100 dollars 100 dollars of minimum wage for a family of five living in an urban center now that is ridiculous by beyond any doubt so we have to have discussion on fair income we have to have a discussion on better working conditions i mean you know we have to start looking at how people live uh, nilanjan talked about uh, you know online education to people who live in a 10 by 10 room sharing with 10 other people how on earth are they going to study so you are so right that uh, that uh, the the importance of looking at decent work decent working conditions decent living conditions is so very critical i hope that uh, that we are able to at least after this tragedy uh, look into that issue thankfully there is some talk about the minimum wage legislation not enough some of us are pushing hard for that there is some talk about ensuring that everybody has health insurance mm-hmm. look at it isn't it really sad that we are uh, that we are at uh, we are facing covid and our work conditions are so uh, uh, health insurance is so minimal you know less than 10% of us have health insurance outside the government sector and uh, and that is why one of the things that we all faced when we fell ill or our family fell ill was that we beca- became impoverished no but no, I, i can also argue i mean because this is something like what uh, jagadish bhagwati famously said about the splintering effect as the economy continue to grow you will have demand for all this subsidiary uh, helping hands like uh, someone who is going to work as domestic yeah. cook someone who is going to work as watchman but i can also argue something on this line saying that it is better to have something rather than having nothing oh yeah oh yeah so so yeah. and and what's your take on this idea of universal uh, basic income i think nilanjan that especially going back to our talk on uh, technology yeah. there is no we have no choice a universal basic income is something whose time has come as kaushik basu said 12 years ago <laughs> so okay. uh, so i think that uh, you know that is that is certainly something we can't shy away from uh, there is enough literature on that those who are interested we'll have a longer chat later but it's a very important topic mm-hmm. i'll just get to george burgis george Yeah, George has answer, asked a very important yeah, question. Answer, 
Uh, George, the answer is that you know we don't have very many renowned economists, and there is only well, one, and that is the, the Read the question uh, for the. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah. So my colleague George is asking, despite having several renowned economists and learned academicians in India, can't our economy do much better? Where are we going wrong, and why? are we not able to translate this knowledge into effective policy framework? In fact, if I were to add to what George is asking, why can't we have Kaushik Basu or Amartya Sen of the world rather than preaching from US <laughs> soil, come and work on Indian soil and try to make a difference, you know? Nilanjan, you know, a mischievous answer to your question is, look at what we did to Rajan. Right. You know, after, after, we, after we literally chased him away, each conference that I went for, whether it was in Europe or the US, they would look at me with, uh, with, you know, as if I was some strange animal saying, you know, this is the best economist in the world. And you not only as not only allowed him to go, you actually chased him away. You know, you insulted him and let, let him go. I mean, I mean, you know, so, so that's a strange thing uh, as to why we don't uh, do that. But George, you know, um, to your question, one, I don't think we have several renowned economists. You know, we have a very big paucity of, uh, you look at the names that we are talking about, the same four or five names we are talking about for a country that is, you know, three trillion dollars now. So we don't have enough. Secondly, uh, do they have a say? I told you that, you know, yes, a lot of our political leaders now want to take professional help. That is true. But you see very often in big, big judgment, in big uh, decisions, you will find that uh, the economist or the professional is simply ignored. Uh, the demonetization experiment is a great example of that. that you know, the, all advice was was put on standby, and we went ahead and did and took one decision that destroyed the economy for so many years. So there is a. I think the basic issue here is that. Um, uh, we are yet not skilled enough. And that is why I think that it's important for us, and that is our responsibility as, uh, as academics, that we have to train a whole new workforce that will be able to provide this, this inputs to, uh, to the policymaker. We don't have enough, really. I mean, you know, um, look at how many people, can you name the number of economists who work on agriculture in India? That's a that's my you know challenge to even the economists and you know count on your fingers. Can you go past five? Agriculture, fifty percent of India's uh, workforce, some three hundred million people work there. How many people work on um, on labor? I don't know. I mean, I always have this problem that if I want to do a conference on any of these issues, health. You know, I've done several conferences this year on health. You know, how many economists do I know who have an uh, understanding of the healthcare sector? You know, I again go back to Nilanja or Devashi. Apart from that, do we have uh, enough people? Nilanja, you know, I mean, you, you've written some fabulous papers on health and pharma. Uh, how many Indian references do you have? So that is, so I think, uh, George, it is really, it's really a supply problem. Of course, there is a big demand problem, right? Of course, there is, but there I'm telling you, uh, I'm just asserting this point that there is a demand now because there is some professionalism that is coming in, but there is a huge supply problem. You know, in, in India, very often we confuse the two. The, just to digress, Nilanjan, on a contemporary issue, look at the vaccination thing. Everybody is talking of hesitancy. Where does hesitancy come in? Hesitancy will come in when there is supply, isn't it? When you don't have vaccines, what, what, what difference does it make if people want to take it or not want to take it? Right. You, today you go to a PhD, there is no vaccine. For, a, for, seven, for 1,200 million uh, doses we want, we have 100. Mm -hmm. So in the case of economists also, we need to produce them. And that's our responsibility in London. Mm -hmm. as, uh, as academics, as professors, you know, we have to ensure that we produce a whole bunch of economists who are going to work in the policy space. In fact, one of my professors in the US, uh, she used to tell me that if you want to make a difference as an economist, you have to actually come out from your classroom yeah. and uh, try to see the world, you know, because yeah. uh, 
don't get lost in alpha, beta, gamma, you know, uh, because that is not going to make much. It's it's good for you to get some paper published, yes, um, and get some kudos. I'm not saying that those are bad things, but no, no, they're very at, very important. Yeah, at least you should be able to relate uh, what you want to do with this uh, knowledge of mathematics and statistics. Okay, I have another question from Tejashi. Yeah, Tejashi, please. Good morning, Professor. It's been a uh, it's been a very informative and insightful session. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I had two questions, and uh, the first one is that I just read about Raghuram Rajan, and you know, I just found out that he's also an engineering graduate. So is there yeah. some correlation between engineering graduates and economists? And the second question is that um, so I've always been very intrigued from uh, about. Uh, jobs in the rbi and you know the world bank yeah and are they something related to economic policy so these so are the my first, two questions so the first uh, correlation uh, they just see it is a coincidence uh, the correlation is not with engineering and economics it is maths and economics so you know what happens is that a lot of engineers do five courses in maths so therefore they are they, are, they, they learn economics easier uh, the second question yes you know rbi hires a number of Economist. There is a whole. Uh, there are two or three streams by which they hire. Uh, one is through the Indian Economic Service, which is a fairly robust exam that uh, that is a good exam to write. And I encourage all those who do uh, uh, an undergrad or a postgrad in economics to take that exam. Um, you can also get in RBI through the Indian Statistical Service. That's a lesser number, but um, the Indian Economic Service dominates. Uh, then it's a brilliant. So, uh, so there is a, a, a lateral entry that is uh, that you will find at the deputy governor level. Uh, you know, economists like Rakesh Mohan, Subir Gokaran, they entered at the deputy governor level. You will soon find an Ilanjan Bani joining somewhere there. Like, Come on, so, <laughs> so, um, so, so, so that is one route. Manmohan Singh, for example, was another uh, who entered there um, and became governor. So. In the World Bank, um, yes, the predominantly the largest number of people that the World Bank or the IMF employs are economists, and uh, they are economists from across the world. Uh, the IMF will be more people who are who are working on on finance, international finance, etc. The World Bank will have more number of people who are working on development issues. So, for example, you know, right now, uh, and this is a this is a answer also to George. Look at, George, look at the big debate today. The big debate today led from the very top. The big pol political economy debate is on population. Now, you know, when you talk about population, who do you who do you want to listen to? You want to listen to the development economies rather than to ideological arguments on, you know, how many children do does this fellow have and how many children does that fellow have and how many children should be mandated. So you know, in the World Bank, those are the kind of people who are um, who are employed. Now. But previously, you know, the World Bank used to be a very uh, glamorous position some time ago, and now the World Bank doesn't employ so many people in India. But internationally, it still is a very large employer. Yeah, they have a quota from each country, I guess. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. India is losing yeah, out to China in a big way. It is, and and plus, you know, plus you get placed also not. So many in India, but even if you get employed from India, you will be placed in uh, like like this friend of mine who is now in Bangladesh, this other friend of mine who is in in uh, Ghana. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Any other thanks, questions? Seriously, thanks. I think, thanks, Milan. Uh, thanks, yeah, Milan. It's, it's a great, great uh, session, I guess. Uh, so much thing to learn from you, and I always look forward inviting you again uh, for one such more session and many more such sessions you know over at Mahindra. Uh, it will be a pleasure to uh, listen to you as always and uh, if you don't have any question let us end this uh, thing and uh, thank you one uh, once more uh, time you know thank uh, you to be to take your time from your busy schedule and address to our uh, student fraternity thank you Thanks so much.